When I was 12 years old, I beat Yoshi's Island for the first time. Instead of feeling a sense of accomplishment though, I almost felt a postpartum kind of way. Not that I've ever experienced that in the sense of pregnancy, and I never will, but it still just hit different. It was the first time in my life I remember feeling such melancholy vibes over having accomplished something neat, and I didn't know how to put my finger on it at such a young age. It wasn't necessarily just the fact that I had beaten the game alone, no. The reason I felt that way is because it was over. A game I loved so much was done, and now I could never experience it in the same way again. It was dead. Fast forward to the end of April 2024. I just played at VGM Con, and let me tell you, that set was special. I played on the smaller stage, but the room was so packed you could hardly get in. My visuals and music were synced perfectly, and the live musicians that performed with me all killed it. I even got to debut a song with one of my childhood heroes, Stemage of Metroid Metal. The set went absolutely perfectly, and it was the epitome of what my goal was as an artist when I started DJing and producing so long ago. I was able to encourage people, rage super hard, and spread a message of love all at the same time. Then it was over. I got sick a few days later, and although it wasn't COVID, it was gnarly. I was sick for like eight days straight, and the combination of both the set being over and being sick set me spiraling into the worst post-con depression I had ever experienced. Like, take the way I felt after beating Yoshi's Island and multiply it by a thousand. Would I ever play a set like that again? It was such a special moment. How could I possibly replicate it? The event was over, dead even, and I was sad. The end of things is something that haunts me. This, my friends, is why in this video, I want to talk about what video games have to say about death. Death is something in my life that I haven't really experienced until recently. Sure, my good friend Owen died almost a decade ago, but within the past couple of months, I have lost people to cancer, suicide, and freak accidents. Three funerals later, I am feeling some kind of way that I cannot put my finger on, but I aim to find out. Now, in video games, death is typically something that is more of a minor inconvenience. You can always try again, right? The number of times you died might be displayed at the end of the game when you beat it too. But other than that, it's just something that gets in the way of your progress. So what can video games actually teach us about death? How can we learn from them in order to live in the present and cherish every moment that we get in reality? Let's dive in. Death is everywhere and nowhere in video games. As stated previously, in many video games, death is not the end, but rather a setback. To try again is a gift. This teaches us how to persevere despite failure, adapt to our environment, create new strategies, and try multiple times until we succeed. Like I touched on in my first video, I tried to beat Through the Fire and Flames on Guitar Hero 3 for a very long time, and I persevered until I beat it. The number of times I died didn't stand in my way, and in fact, every time that I died, I learned from my mistakes and got better each time I tried again. I learned to deal with my frustrations every time I died, and the closer I progressively got to beating things motivated me more and more each time I tried. That said, when I was growing up, games were <laughs> a lot harder. They didn't really hold your hand like games today do. You had to either figure it out or read the manual if you wanted to know what you were doing in most games. When you died, you didn't respawn back in the same room either. If you hadn't saved your game, you'd lose all your progress back to the last time you saved. This made dying in older games really frustrating, but also so much more satisfying when you actually won. I definitely hated those final bosses that didn't have a save point right before the battle though, and in several games I played as a kid, this was the case. Take Star Tropics, for example. You actually had to beat the entire last dungeon and then Zoda, the game's final boss. Otherwise, if you died at any point, you had to play the whole level over again. In most games today, you can just respawn before the boss fight and try again. There is something to be said about this minor convenience in modern gameplay, and don't get me wrong, I do actually enjoy the fact that I don't have to waste so much time if I die in a game anymore. Again though, it was so satisfying when you actually beat a game that was harder. Now, this is not meant to be just a way for me to say older games are better because this isn't a true blanket statement. There are several games that I used to play back in the day that are trash, and there are modern games that blow these out of the water despite being easier. According to Emma Rie, quote, One could also make the case that the apparent tribalization of death in video games reflects a core tension in current Western representations of death. Across popular media, death is either staged as a shocking spectacle or it is euphemistic basically elated, but in video games, it is often both things at once. It's this crossroads between the two extremities that I want to focus on as it relates to real life.
in wooden reels and the maintenance of virtual life, gaming, and the death drive in a digital age. Jeffrey Douglas gives us some major philosophical insights surrounding death in video games that I find very helpful. First, it must be said that humans desire to pursue quote, the instinct to create virtual supplements in order to master that which one cannot. One derives pleasure from this mastery by defying, through simulation, what cannot be denied in reality. If we apply Freud's theory specifically to gaming, and to digital gaming in particular, the drive to experience the real through matrices and virtual worlds is a symptom of our desire to confront and master loss without actually having to confront that loss. That is, from a safe distance. Now, I won't compare, say, the death of a video game character to losing someone in real life. The difference is obviously stick. However, humans desire to master death, even though they know they never can and never will. Everything dies. Nothing lives forever. So to tiptoe on the edge of death in a video game might just be the closest we can come to our mastery over it, as the more we die, the more we learn, and the more we are likely to live in-game. Douglas notes, quote, as Gary Westfall puts it, the skillful player must embrace the experience of death to be successful. He also remarks that connecting Boudry's novel to the Super Mario Bros. experience and the compulsion to traverse the space of death in order to return with the knowledge of its enigmas, Westfall adds that literally the more often Mario dies, the better the player becomes. In a true Zen paradox, players must repeatedly kill their Marios in order to better maintain their lives in future games. In essence, one dies so that one may live. What a way to think about things. Obviously, in the real world, death is the final nail in the coffin. However, if we think about death as failing in the real world, just as death in video games essentially means failing, we have to pick up and try again. This is the only way to go. No matter what things life throws at us, and trust me, life will throw bullshit at us, we have to stay resilient and use each moment like this as an opportunity to progress and transform into something better than we were before. I remember watching ScrewAttack.com videos one day at my friend Kevin's house. I think I was in ninth grade at the time, and although I don't remember the particular video that was playing, I recall watching Aerith from Final Fantasy VII die in a cutscene. The narrators of the video made it very clear that this happened really early in the game and mentioned how insane it was. I was, for some reason, captivated by this. My young brain knew I had to experience whatever this game held one day. And when I finally played Final Fantasy VII, everything that happened to lead up to that moment made it all the more crushing when she finally died. Since death happens all the time in video games, I feel it is necessary to discuss Aerith's death. After all, it's arguably the most infamous death in all of video game lore. No other character dying in a game hit me like her death, and though the psychology we discussed earlier is fascinating, it doesn't really give us any concrete answers for how to cope with death in the real world. More specifically, Aerith is slain by Sephiroth, the game's main villain and final boss. She is murdered at a point in the game where you are not expecting her to die at all. It's an incredible example of a game using death to drive the narrative of the story and transform gameplay, rather than just hindering progress. As such, when I experienced this in my place, through, I had to be cunning and shift my strategy in the absence of a dedicated healer. That said, the way that the murder happens impacted me like crazy. As user Chip Noir on GameFAQs.com remarked some years ago, it was the senselessness of the death. Most people point it out, and it's technically true that Aerith's death was not a Chekhov's gun level of importance. It was an emotional drive and I'll argue hard that Sephiroth wasn't afraid of Holy so much, knowing that Aerith could tug Cloud away from handing him the real MacGuffin of the game, the Black Materia. Now, the novellas and Advent Children give her character a dose of super steroid, making her the super Cetra that is arbitrarily the only character to have been confirmed to be dead. Sephiroth's defeat is muddy and poorly defined, yet has life beyond death as a fully conscious entity. So really, Aerith's death is senseless. Sephiroth knew Holy was easy to manage, and it wasn't going to be the save grace of the planet. Consider this. There was no reason Sephiroth couldn't have swept in and cut 
all of their heads off. Avalanche, until late game, would have stood no chance against Sephiroth in his meanest forms. Yet he chose the next opportunity, after they get the Black Materia, to off the most defenseless character. Air's death served no other purpose but to add another chink in Cloud's armor and drive him up to the North Crater. It was malicious and calculated from a villain that until that point was not directly threatening them. You can even argue he used the Genova forms to ensure that the party can handle reaching him in the first place. Nomura expressed that he wanted to show a character being killed off and not having any heroic follow-through. Final Fantasy IV is full of death. Well, two deaths and a lot of fakeouts, but the point is that they were all action hero deaths, full of meaning and importance. Same for Galuf and arguably, I guess, General Leo, but Aerith's death serves no purpose to anyone but the villain, and even the villain knows it isn't 100% necessary. That smirk he gives is the smirk of someone who knows he's done something terribly cruel to someone at their lowest point, and almost relishes the level of mental damage it does. Sometimes in life, we face Sethroths, or I could even say we face Ridleys, you know, those who kill and wreak havoc for the sake of wreaking havoc and nothing else. Now, sometimes bad things just happen in life, so our aggressors do not take a human form 100% of the time. Yet other times, we are wronged by people in seemingly grotesque ways, which has the propensity to kill our innocence and make us see the world in a completely different way than we did before. What are we supposed to do about this? Heck, there might even be a faction of you that think my life is happy-go-lucky all the time, as I'm generally a positive person, and I've been told by countless people that my energy is something that they wish they could bottle up. <laughs> Don't get it twisted, though. Bad things happen in my life, too, all the time. People have stolen from me, cheated me, lied to get ahead of me, and at times even physically hurt me. There is a certain part of me that is definitely careful, of course, as anyone should be, but I just have this weird sense of resilience. I haven't let these things ruin my belief in the fact that most people are good and that we can accomplish more united than divided. How have I maintained this outlook on life despite having gone through traumatic things? In my third video in this series, I spoke about Buddhist philosophy and the concept of impermanence. Now, I related this to time and time travel within video games, but the concept can also very much relate to death and being wronged in life by someone or something outside of your control. Once we understand that all things have a propensity to change and that nothing stays constant, confronting the fact that life will end, sometimes even unexpectedly, is easier to cope with. Initially, Cloud, the main character in Final Fantasy VII, reacts to Aerith's death through shock and denial, which is common in real life. I know that back in the day when my friend Owen passed away, I had similar thoughts. I was training for a new job the week he died and I heard that he was recovering nicely. Then all of a sudden, he passed away from a brain hemorrhage. To this day, not visiting him in the hospital before he died is the one thing I regret in my life. I even went so far as to travel to Amsterdam with his family to spread his ashes among some tulips. It was the first time in my life that anyone I had cared about died, so I had to accept what occurred and come to terms with processing my grief rather than trying to suppress it. That weekend was healing in many ways for me because we all united around reminiscing about memories to honor Owen and how much he meant to us. This is similar to how the party in Final Fantasy VII reunites and leans on each other after Aerith was slain. It is important to grieve alone, yes, but processing such events with others is always a good idea that can absolutely lift our spirits and sustain our mental health. They say time heals all wounds. And while this may be true to a certain extent, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't also go looking for closure. While certain types of closure might not always be available to us in real life, coming to terms with the death of things should be something we seek, knowing that everything will happen in due time. It's not a race, and everyone processes grief differently. Just like Cloud and the party in Final Fantasy VII, you too can face the inevitability of suffering with courage. Now, circling back to impermanence, it's also a good practice to allow oneself the mental space to practice non-attachment. After Aerith was murdered, the party was forced to relinquish their expectations for the future, embrace the present moment, and strengthen themselves moving forward to take on Sephiroth. As Aerith herself said, I'll be going now. I'll come back when this is all over.
We enjoy the notion that we as a species can master something unmasterable. That's why death in video games is interesting to me. When one is skilled at a game, they seemingly master something that, in reality, we have no control over. All of us will die at some point, and when others around us die, especially ones we are close to, sometimes the feeling that we get, other than missing these people, is one of existential dread, and a staunch reminder that we cannot do anything about it. In reality, we have not mastered death just yet. So where does that leave us as mortal humans? Well, my response is twofold as there is no easy answer in this predicament. The first thing I want to highlight is that you must embrace your pain. Do not run from it. Now, I'm not talking about taking this too far and fetishizing death or anything. However, standing up to your fears in this regard is akin to how Samus stood up to Ridley in Metroid Other M. Though she was absolutely terrified at first, she still fought the battle, and she won. See my previous video about Samus and Mount Home. I think that we all want an easy answer here. This pain sucks, but there isn't one. Yet embracing your pain will enable you to appreciate the fact that you are still here and that better times are ahead. You won't heal without this. Just as Clive in Final Fantasy 16 came to terms with the fact that he caused his own brother's death, so too must you come to terms with the things that have happened, accept them, learn from them, and move forward. This leads me to my second point. While DJing at MAGFest in January of 2024, while I played mine and Hanabi's Close My Eyes remix from Secret of Mana, I gave a little speech to the crowd, which you can see in my MAGFest video on YouTube. The great part about video game deaths, as mentioned before, is that you can always pick up and try again. I've never played a game that is literally just over when you die, although <laughs> developers, there's an idea. <laughs> you can try beating Sin in Final Fantasy X 14 times and beat the boss on the 15th. You can play Super Metroid 5,000 times and get close to Oats and Goat's prestige on the 5,001st time. You can fail 10,000 times to invent something and figure out the way that it works on your next shot. Or, in my case, you could fail at being a DJ for 15 years and finally find success on the 16th year. Viana Neto argues that video game deaths are, quote, uninteresting because, quote, video game death is reversible, whereas death in the animal slash physical world is permanent. However, I think that the fact that we do get a second chance in video games is what makes it incredibly interesting. If you are still here, if you are still breathing, your life matters. Don't ever think that you cannot start over and try again. Play your song of time to start over, whatever that may be. It's not too if even people like Bruce from Skyward Sword can change and become better humans that actually do good in the world, so too can you. You just have to want it, and you have to create your own future. Neto also notes that, quote, existential terror is what spurs fragile human beings to create cultural marvels, scientific discoveries, and century-spanning lineages in the futile but necessary hope that a human life can indeed have an everlasting impact on the world, and is thus imbued with inherent meaning. Whatever motivates you to do things in life, I just hope that you you are doing for me, I definitely say YOLO all the time, but I actually mean it. Like, no, I mean it. As Neto also argues, one possible reason death is largely unexplored in video games is due to this fundamental human impulse to deny it, to push it into the deep recesses of our minds and endeavor to transcend it completely. Though some might push it back to a place where it cannot be accessed, I do not do this. The fact that I am going to die someday is something that is always taunting me, and I use that as the fuel I need to have all the experience as I can, love all the people I can, and be the best version of myself that I can possibly be. None of us are promised tomorrow, and I fully realize that the impact I will have on society is being built in the here and now. This is another reason why living in the present is so important. Video games allow players to easily relocate their internal death anxiety onto the character, while at the same time offering it, the character, as an effigy to be sacrificed at will and without consequence in order to elicit a cathartic, sequential experience of birth, death, and rebirth. In a video game, the player can be, by way of their surrogate, both mortal and immortal. This truth has subconsciously taught me that I need to take chances in life and pick up myself if I fail. Video games have taught me that failure is an inevitable option, that if I don't build upon my failures, I'll never get anywhere, and that I can always try again. When I was younger, I always hated the cold. Living in Minnesota almost my whole life really sucked. However, one day my brother Rob just told me, just be cold. The simplicity of that was so profound. From then on, I would hear him repeat that to me, just be cold. Every time thereafter that I felt this way, I would just embrace it. It's like the cold didn't have power over me since I wasn't fighting it anymore. On a similar note, in the essay, I'm Not Afraid, Zombies, Video Games, and Life After Death by Jared Rosseo, the author speaks about his four-year-old daughter's fascination with spooky and scary media, apexed by her desire to watch him play Dead Rising, a violent video game about zombies. She would always tell him, I'm not afraid, 
side. But then, as the game got more violent, they would be scared and entertained together. When she was three, his daughter asked him about death. Jared notes that he enjoyed hearing her say the word because that almost stripped it of its power. Jared also remarks in a comic strip within the article that it's easy to think of our children as innocent and pure, as the better form a human can take. Much of this, I think, comes from how much we love them, how much light we project onto them, and maybe what we wish for them. That if we give them enough, they can somehow escape the inescapable. That the world holds incredible pain, grief, and suffering, and that some of it is waiting for them. This is where acceptance has to come into play. The world is indeed full of pain, grief, and suffering. When you are playing a video game, you know that you will almost certainly die. You go into the game knowing this, and that is something that I believe subconsciously strips death of its power. I'm not saying that we should become lackadaisical about death, I'm not saying we shouldn't care, but it is devastating to think about people we know who have died, to think about the fact that our loved ones will die, and to even contemplate our own deaths. What I am saying, though, is that to acknowledge that we will die someday can easily serve as the fuel we need to live every waking moment to do good in the world, spread light, and cherish the moments we get. Knowing we will die is what makes video games enjoyable, as we have a blast when we are playing the game in between these moments of demise. This is the strongest parallel I can probably make between video games, death, and living our lives to the fullest, and I hope it resonated with you as much as it did with me when I initially typed it. I wanted to see what an actual mortician thought about death, as they deal with it every day for their livelihoods. This brought me to Caitlin Dowdy's YouTube channel. Caitlin is the face of the death positivity movement, which isn't a movement to fetishize death, but to be real and transparent about it, just as I noted previously. The more we talk about taboo subjects, the easier they are to deal with and make informed decisions about. In one particular video, she tells us to imagine what you would want to happen to your body after you are dead. She suggests that this helps you cope, and I believe she is right. This legitimately did help me cope when I realized I want a natural burial and to have my remains go right right back into the earth instead of to be cremated or put into a casket. It also led me to find out about the game A Mortician's Tale. There is an amazing video on it from the developer, Gabby Dalrienzo, leading a panel about it at GDC in 2018. Within this video, she explains several aspects of her journey and how she views death and her eventual path towards developing the game. As previously mentioned, she notes that death in video games is used to punish the player into being better, and also narratively to motivate players to extinguish the in-game evil. Most most importantly though, Darienzo informs viewers that a lot of her initial death anxiety in life, at least partly, was overcome by playing Zelda Majora's Mask. Specifically, she was blown away by the people in Clock Town who just continued to live their lives without pause, even though they knew they were going to die. Some, like the Carpenters, deny it completely. But the mailman, who Gabby specifically mentions, tells Link that he's still going to deliver the mail despite the circumstances. It blew her mind, and now that I think about it, it also blows mine. What would you do if you knew it was your last day on Earth? Would you grieve the fact that you are going to die, or would you live every last moment you could to squeeze the last juices out of life? Because we all grieve in different ways, Gabby tells us that a big part of being a mortician is not to tell someone how to grieve, but to listen to them when they are grieving. Let people have their moments. Be there to listen to them when they need it, and actually listen. You don't need to fix someone in this process. Listen, observe, and report. This is the way. Also, if you are on the other side of this equation, don't hold it in. Sure, you may need a moment to process it, like Clive from Final Fantasy 16 had to process the truth about how his brother died, yet when he was finished, he immediately talked about it with Jill, his party mate, and they made a decision to do something about it. At some point, you have to discuss your feelings with others because it's not healthy for you to keep it all inside. You will eventually implode from the stress, and this doesn't help anyone. I was so intrigued by this GDC talk that I purchased A Mortician's Tale and played it as part of my research for this video. I learned a lot about the death process, funeral etiquette, how to prepare bodies for cremation or burial, and more. Like, did you know embalming isn't necessary in a traditional burial? I sure didn't. Also, I learned five things to never say at funerals. Number one, at least they are no longer suffering. Not your place to say this because it is not your call to say that someone's loved one dying is for the best. Two, were they saved? Don't make it religious. Not everyone is religious and this just makes shit, well, awkward. Three, they are with the angels now. Same reason as number two. Number four, let me know how I can help. 
Although this comes from a good place, someone who is grieving is not in any place to do any more logistics than they have had to do throughout the funeral process. It's a lot of work. If you want to say specific things like, can I come over and cook you a meal soon? Or something like that, it's way better than presenting a grieving person with an abstract idea that may or may not be followed through on. And number five, I know how you feel. Yeah, you might, but everyone grieves differently, so don't try to compare your pain to what someone else is feeling. Just say, I'm sorry, and that you will be there for them. And in lieu of phrase four, maybe offer them something concrete and follow through with it. While it is a somber occasion, I suppose a positive aspect about death could be that it can bring families together who haven't seen each other in a while. Coming together as a unit to honor someone's legacy is surely a good thing, even if the legacy was negative. If people are still brought together, they can unite under a shared purpose and grow together. Heck, when my grandpa died recently, it brought the family I don't see very often together. We had discussions about how we need to actually prioritize seeing each other more often and we cried and healed alongside one another. It was truly a moment I needed in my life and I have vowed since to make more of an effort to get together with that side of the family. In a mortician's tale, the people have all died in different ways. The breast cancer death specifically made me cry uncontrollably. I almost couldn't go through with it. Like, I wanted to quit the game right there. <laughs> this is how my aunt died, and it really triggered me at first. But I pressed on. The process was cremation, exactly what happened to her. And I learned here that cremation is not burning a body into ash, but placing bone fragments in a cremulant. Super interesting. Anyways, the people in the funeral section were saying things like, she'd hate this music. She wanted us to be smiling, and since my aunt loved Dancing Queen by ABBA, this is literally the same sentiment. I lost it when I read that phrase. Another person said, she fought really hard. She was proud of herself. She never gave up not once, which is exactly how my aunt fought. She was positive and wanted people smiling until the end, and since I was with her until about 15 minutes before she passed, I know this to be true. I wept as I played this portion. Despite my aunt literally being in the hospice industry, I hadn't experienced something like this ever, so I wasn't ready for all the feelings it would bring. Who knew it was a video game that would give me this kind of closure for such a moment? To Gabby and all the developers who made a mortician's tale, all I can say is thank you. The end of a mortician's tale is one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. Towards the end of the game, the company that Charlie, the main character, works for gets bought out by a corporate or Lo and behold, they are only concerned about profit. The wishes of the people don't matter. The almighty dollar does. And this is clear in every single email you see from the CEO in the game. Man, even in some people's most tumultuous times, there are a sickening and disturbing class of people that are trying to extract every last dollar out of people. It's gross. In the very last funeral in the game, where Charlie works for Rose and Daughters, the company in the game, the new CEO, Chad, goes against the family's wishes of what their mother wanted, a home funeral. He instead tries to upsell them to a standard funeral package. The family complies with this, probably out of pressure and never having been in this kind of situation before. One of the last conversations you see in the funeral home is the dad and daughter talking about her mother. Daughter, do you think we did the right thing? I feel bad not doing what mom asked for. Dad, I know honey, but what that Chad guy said seems right. We don't want to dishonor her memory by letting her rot. Daughter, sniffles. Yeah, I just want mom to know I loved her. I wish I hadn't yelled at her before. Dad, shh, it's okay. She knew you loved her. Fights happen. Please don't be hard on yourself. Daughter. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to miss her. Dad. Me too. Is there anywhere corporate greed hasn't touched? Goodness. We must honor the dead's wishes, not the funeral industry's desire to make money. And yo, funeral industry, honor people over your business. I know you have to stay solvent, but is it really worth it when you were dishonoring people? You could always allocate dollars better. CEO Chad also mentions in an email that they do not do green burials and that the employees should be upselling at any cost as it's part of their job. Yeah, don't honor people's wishes for their loved ones in death. No, 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 upsell them, baby. <laughs> Corporations! Circling back to another thought from Neto, quote, Video games mythological rhetoric communicated primarily through the player character can serve as the locus for the individual's transcendent heroic project in an age in which the simulation and the real are indiscernible from each other. And when dominant culture can no longer provide the individual with its own serviceable mythical illusions. What this means to me is that our culture in the West is so devoid of actual meaning that video games have become a replacement for 
for something concrete. They serve as a way to provide us with some kind of story to be engrossed in, or rather something to live for in the face of a culture that has failed to provide us with any meaning at all other than work, 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 and make the 1% more money than they already need. Well, Charlie, what you did at the end of A Mortician's Tale makes you one of my absolute heroes in any video game I've ever played. In the final scene, we see a new office that is different from the Rose and Daughters office that Charlie used to be in. You read in her emails that she has started her own venture. Then you go outside and discover that she is assisting a family with a green burial. Charlie got sick of the corporate greed and went out to start her own venture where she was able to help a family do what they wanted to honor their loved one. This is a beautiful thing. Sure, it may not have brought in as much money, but it was the thing that mattered in life and in death. This ending made me cry, as we are literally listening to right now. <laughs> that was a beautiful fucking ending. And it reminded me of the death of ideas in my life. Some people say when one door closes, another door opens, but I don't always think this is the best way to convey this idea. After all, is there any guarantee that there's another door? No. However, when an idea dies, a new idea always replaces it. It has to. When you logically think about this, it makes total sense. The death of my old corporate job, for instance, brought me to this weird and awesome creator lifestyle I am living and I've never been happier. I don't want to say that every time an idea dies, a new better idea replaces it, yet a new and better idea has the potential to replace it. And we must recognize that there is an opportunity there. Then, we should do the best we can in that instance to not let something subpar take its place. This, my friends, is where growth and progression take place if we have the awareness to move forward in a positive manner. Awareness takes experience too. As Nato mentioned before, the more we kill off Mario, the better we become in the game. This, my friends, is the very definition of experience. I previously mentioned that one of my regrets in life was not visiting my friend Owen in the hospital before he died. His wife Sue told me the same thing that the aforementioned father told his daughter in the last funeral in A Mortician's Tale. Owen knew you loved him. Things happened, but we cannot beat ourselves up for it. If these phrases are true, and I believe they are. In the love Owen had for me, he wouldn't want me to live in regret. He'd want me to move forward and kick ass in life. So Owen, I know that you're gone, but I am kicking ass in life right now, just like you would have wanted. I love you and I miss you. I am moving forward with no regrets here years later in a positive manner because <laughs> a video game of all things brought me the closure that I needed. And they say video games can't teach us anything in life. <laughs> what a joke. Hey, if you got something out of this video, please like and subscribe. Check out my channel, because I make a lot of club-ready video game remixes and nerdy mental health content. Next time, we're going to talk about something really heavy on my heart, overconsumption of media and social media in general, which I became hyper aware of during my sabbatical in May of 2024. It's harmful for society. We all know it, yet we keep using it. While games like The Sims did warn us in subtle ways about this, and I'm going to accentuate those subtleties and expand on what other games say about this until we all understand what they are. Until next time, take care of each other.